those are the early days of zombie films. I'm going to take quite a jump forward then from 1940. We're going to jump forward a quarter of a century to, well, the zombie film, really. The, the, mm. the progenitor of all that came afterwards. Scott, let's talk about Mr. Romero. Yes, Night of the Living Dead. And of course, George A. Romero is surely the name most synonymous with zombies. And for decades, the version he puts forward in Night of the Living Dead defined what zombies were. Out goes the voodoo magic, in comes the nuclear boogeyman as the ill-defined radiation is theorised at least to bring the dead back to a form of life where they chow down on any hapless humans around. Judith O'Day's Barbara runs for her life to shelter, having had the misfortune to be in a cemetery when all this kicks off, which is very much a worst case scenario. There he, she meets Dwayne Jones's Ben at the shack, where they and a few other survivors must defend themselves while waiting for news to come over the wire on what exactly is going on and what they should do. A point of tension and conflicts for humans, as it always is. Essentially this is a siege movie, and it's a bloody effective one. It's not got the same levels of bloodlust that we'll see going forward, as the effects and budgets allowed, but for me this is the most tense, certainly of Romero's films, and possibly of all the films we'll talk about today, uh, with a powerhouse performance from Dwayne Jones tying things together, and a few real gut punches saved for one of the best final reels in horror cinema. Excellent. Probably my favourite zombie movie, um, it has been from when I first saw it donkeys ago. It's slower paced than a lot of the things you'll see, it's certainly got a lot less violence than, than you'll see it from it, and that makes it all the more shocking when the last real things finally do kick off, and of course there's the the, the twist at the end, which I, I'm, I'm even going to refrain from saying, even though it's, what, 60 years old or something by this point, but yeah, just really, really good, very tensely executed, and it's an absolute masterclass in what you can do with so little money to produce such good results. It's actually, uh, it's 50 years old, but 50 released on the 1st of October 1968 right. so it's it was spot on it's 50th anniversary and just uh, again it's another side this is another one very easy to come by because this is out of copyright because they forgot to put the copyright notice on the film and therefore it doesn't count anymore at least by the laws of that time so it's in the public domain as well so well done Walter Reed organization <laughs> yeah this is I think there's certainly an argument to be made that this is the best zombie film of the world. To, to refer to any one film as the best or anything you're not hiding to nothing there but certainly mm. there's an argument that could be made about it and it is wonderfully clinical simple and effective in the way that for instance Assault on Precinct 13 is mm. and you're right it is in most respects a siege film now it's certainly not my favourite zombie film it's not my favourite Romero film either although again possibly best but not the most entertaining, and that's sometimes a distinction you have to make. Mm-hmm. But yes, it is just so it's so simple, and the the recent restoration that was done uh, looks fantastic as well, and mm-hmm. it, it really belies its budget. As I mentioned earlier, but zombie films being particularly good value for money, this film and it looks fantastic. It's just been so nicely restored. It's a really crisp, clean cinematography shot for a hundred and fourteen thousand dollars <laughs> with a box office of 30 million dollars <laughs> that's a heck of an investment well done mr romero well done there indeed um, yeah there's not really an awful lot about this film i don't like it's again it's not my favorite by any means but it is just it's so close to being about as perfect as you can be because there's so little of change perfect in that way yeah and if you Prescribe to the sort of Steve Jobs minimalist strip everything out school of uh, perfection and this is about as close to perfection as you can make a zombie film. You can't really take much else out of it uh, yeah. and still have it function as a film. So. There are. I mean, I kind of find it frustrating to watch just because I just really want someone to, you know, slap Barbara or something because she's... Just... I mean, and I know she's like the victim. She's seen this she, horrible thing happen, but she just drives day. me crazy because she's just sitting there in a stupid... <laughs> It's frustrating. <laughs> I, I know you've horrible things have happened to you. But if you don't move, you will die. <laughs> that ought to wake you up a bit. But yeah. there's perhaps one moment that I I don't know if it's meant to be funny. Or I've ever really just seen so many other films. That it's what makes this funny. But there's one moment that makes me laugh, which is when Ben goes down into the cellar and sees the little girl having started eating her dad, and she's just standing there, mm. like blood dripping out of her mouth, and. That makes me laugh. I think it's because the idea of a small child looking like a demon like that, as a zombie, is an inherently funny thing nowadays. <laughs> In 1968, that seemed more shocking. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's again. I mean, if you're going to talk about zombie films, you can't not talk about this one. And if you want to tell anyone, talk to anyone about zombie films, to get them into it, you need to begin with this. Really, yes, it's it's the archetypal zombie film, and I. In terms of what came after it, I suspect Dawn of the Dead is more influential. But just sort of establishing the modern zombie film, this is it. Yeah. And it doesn't have the goriness that went on to market most other zombie films. It doesn't need it. The idea of these people bursting through the the doors is enough. Mm -hmm. But it has one upside over Dawn of the Dead, which had a considerably larger budget. But in that... Because it's shot in black and white, you can't see how bad the paint on the people is. Yeah, yeah. I guess we'll talk about more of that in Dawn of the Dead. But yeah, it's some odd choices in <laughs> Tom Savini, I guess. But yeah, I don't know what else to say about this film. It's just... And it's one of those films... I almost feel like it's been co-opted with the claims about the themes and stuff it has. And it's like... About what the zombies mean. And it's about fear of, like, black people or things like that. So it's been... Um, co-opted for so many things and certainly especially as we'll, we'll go on to see in the next two films that George Romero certainly is putting plenty of social commentary into his films but at the same time it's like, I didn't look at this and I'm like yeah it's like this weird thing has happened people are being attacked they have to survive I don't really see it I give it any other reading at all I don't really think it carries any other reading very well I've always thought any reading of any social commentary onto any of Romero's films is a real stretch. Not so much with this, because I don't really detect any attempt to put anything in it at all. It's just, wouldn't it be crazy if dead people came back? Um, but yeah, Dawn of Dead in particular is held up for a lot of analysis that I don't think it actually bears, but uh, I suppose we'll get onto that. I think the one thing that Dawn of the Dead really bears up is with the idea of crash consumerism. But it's not even like you have to map it onto it. It's like the characters straight up say... They're kind of brainless and they're all they remember is that the mall was important to them, so they come here now. You don't have to like, try and search for that. The characters straight up say it. Yeah. The rest of the stuff I, I'm not really buying. Insert gif of uh, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place saying, I know authors who use subtext and they're all cowards. 